Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. So uh, there is a way to solve this question algebraically, and I won't go into that here because it's pretty easy to find online uh, you know, the, the proper mathematical way to solve this. I'd like to spend our time instead on um, exploring a more unique reasoning-based approach to, to thinking about this problem. Uh, so firstly, let me just say what, um, what tipped me off that I might want to use this technique that I'm about to use. When I read this question, I notice that it's all hypothetical. We have a hypothetical situation where you drive an hour longer at a higher average speed, and we're comparing that to another hypothetical situation where you drive two hours longer at an average speed that's 10 miles per hour higher than than whatever the truth is. And we don't actually have any information about the, the reality. We, we, we're just talking about the difference between reality and hypothetical situation number one versus the difference between reality and hypothetical situation number two. So that's making me think that I don't really care what the reality is. I'm more interested in the differences between reality and each hypothetical situation. Does that make sense so far? So here's what I would do to uh, help myself digest the situation and, and think about it more clearly. I would draw a horizontal axis that will be the time spent, and I will draw a vertical axis that will represent speed. And I'm going to decide somewhat randomly that the reality is that speed for that much time. So this would be the true average speed in reality, and that's how long the drive takes in reality. And the reason I drew it like this with a vertical axis and a horizontal axis is because the area in this rectangle represents what? Distance. That's right. The area is the product of the speed multiplied by the time. So this area represents the actual distance, not in either of the hypothetical situations, but the actual distance covered. And I don't care what that area is because I'm more focused on the difference in area as I start building up the hypothetical situations. So I'm going to draw another rectangle here. This one will be hypothetical situation number one, and it's going to look like something like that. And what we have there is one hour is the difference in time. Let's put that there this distance or this difference is one hour and the difference in speed is five it's five miles per hour that's that difference is five and we are told that that extra area when we highlight the extra area in some color this extra area is apparently 70. That's that. Let's, uh, let's build another rectangle now to represent uh, the second hypothetical scenario. So now we're adding another 5 and another hour. So it looks something like that. All right. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's again 5 and again 1, because now we can say the following. We can say, look, This area here matches this area to its left. 
and this area here at the top matches the area directly below it. They're identical, they're the same amount. So if, if this, uh, what color is that gray slash purple color is 70, then this yellow is also 70. And we just have a little bit more, I'll give it another color, say orange, that we need to compute. So you've got 70 here, another 70 immediately above and immediately to the right. And then this little orange area would be 1 multiplied by the height there is 10. So that orange area is 10. So you've got 70 plus 70 plus 10, and now we have our answer. Exactly, yeah, I show that in the book when we talk about uh, the special products and also about foil in general like when you're when you're multiplying a sum times a difference for example or something like that uh, and yeah so I, sh I think the graphical the graphic approach uh, it just makes it very visual and very intuitive and I, I would prefer this approach I think over algebra for a question like this partly because with algebra you have a much higher chance of making a careless error or you know misunderstanding what the question is asking because you're trying to apply, um, I don't know, something about algebra just makes it a bit more mindless, right? And you're just kind of trying your best to match your variables to what the question is talking about, but it's, n I think it's never going to be as mindful as drawing a picture. Yeah, basically, um, I said to myself, this height is 10, and the width of the orange thingy is 1 based on what we have here below. So it's 1 times 10 is 10. The common thread among all the questions we'll see today is that they're all rate work questions of some kind or another, but we'll see that the actual approaches that I use on each question, um, they're quite different. There's a diverse uh, there's a, there's some diversity in my approaches that we'll see today, and I, I think that's kind of a cool uh, a cool thing to see, right? Like different questions that seem like they're from the same category, but they require very different types of solutions. The motivation here for me to to use a different approach is the words. 1.5 times the something. That's ratio language. Something is one and a half times as much as something else. We're talking about rates here, so we have a ratio of rates that would be three to two, because if something is one and a half times as much as something else, then you can just uh, expand that ratio by a factor of two. If you were to start this way, fast to slow, and you could expand by a factor of two, and now it's three to two, like that. Now, I always like to turn a two-way ratio into a three-way ratio. So in this case, probably would be interesting to think about how quick they are together. So that's how quick they are together. And now, as I read the question, I have to decide, of these three columns, which two do I want to continue to work with? Because otherwise, the level of complexity is just greater than what you'd need on the GMAT. So I, I'm going to drop one of these three columns, and I'll make that decision based on what I know and what I want to know. So I know how long it takes them together, so I'll keep the together column. I want to know how long the faster pump takes on its own, so I'll keep the fast pump column as well. I'm now going to drop that middle column because it's just not interesting for us. And then I can say, look, if this is the ratio of the rates between the fast pump and the two pumps together, then what would be the ratio of the time? It would be the reciprocal, because the faster you are, the less time you take. So now I can say that the fast pump will take five-thirds as long as they do together for whatever job. If whatever the job is, the fast pump takes five-thirds as long as they do together. You could read the ratio in the other direction. Together, they take three-fifths as long as the fast pump would take on its own. Now, in our case, we know how long they take together. Together, it's four hours. And we want to know about the fast pump on its own. And from my ratio, I can see that it's going to take five-thirds as long as it would take them together. 
So that's my answer, 5 thirds of 4, and so choice E. Oh, you're, I see what you're doing. You're trying to say, well, if the three ratio units represent four hours, then the scale factor must be four over three. And I'm looking for this number, so it would be five multiplied by four over three. Yep, you could solve it that way as well. Isn't that how you do it? Or? Um, I mean, it's mathematically it's the same, but the way I think about it is a bit different. I go directly from this horizontal ratio, and I just verbalize it. I just say the fast pump on its own would take five thirds as long. I got the five thirds just from looking at that ratio five to three. So I never actually found the scale factor technically, but mathematically it's all the same. It's just, you know, going uh, vertical versus going horizontal. That's basically the difference. So we had, in the end of the day, we had the, the ratio of the time between fast and together was five to three. You wanted me to say again, without the scale factor, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So without the scale factor, I can interpret this ratio in a couple of different ways. Uh, I can read it this way. The faster pump takes five thirds as long as they take together. That's one way I can interpret it. And the other way I can read it is from right to left. All right, together, they take three fifths as long as the faster pump would take on its own. So those two sentences that I wrote, they're, they're equivalent, they mean the same thing. It's just a matter of do you read your horizontal ratio from left to right or from right to left? Uh, and you can choose which way you want to read it based on the task at hand. I mean, in this case, we know how long they take together, so I'd rather read it from left to right and say, the faster pump would take five thirds as long as four hours and there's your answer. So I guess you could look at that as a shortcut compared to the scale factor method for, uh, for working with ratios. In fact, why don't we practice that? Because it's such an important skill. Let's have the three-way ratio and practice it. So we add fast, uh, faster to slower, two together. The ratio of the rates was uh, three to two to five. And let's just leave that. Let's just leave that on the screen and now type up a few different inferences that we can make from that three-way ratio. So as Chris said, we could interpret that as the slower pump would take five halves as long as they take together. We could say uh, the slow pump is two thirds as fast as the faster pump. And therefore would take three halves as long to do a job. So I won't type any more, but who wants to volunteer another inference we could make from the three way ratio? That's right. Combined, they would take three-fifths as much time as the faster pump on its own. That's right. Together, they'll take two-fifths as long as the slower pump would take on its own for a given job. No? I mean, if they're asking you for an actual number, then they have to also give you an actual number. But maybe the question doesn't want an actual number. Maybe the question just wants to know uh, what percent faster are they together compared to just the slower pump on its own. The correct answer for that would be 150% in this case. And you could answer that without the first sentence. You could drop the first sentence of the problem completely. Just start from the second sentence and then ask, what percent faster are they together compared to the slower pump on its own? And you can answer that without any actual numbers. Yeah, yeah, it would take 50% more time. The slower pump would take 50% more time than the faster pump on its own for a given job. That's correct. I would only use percentages at the very end of the question if they're asking for a percent change. If they're not asking for a percent change, I would never introduce it myself. If they are asking for it, I'll do all of the work I can do in the world of ratios and then at the very end convert to percent. Because percents are just not nearly as useful 
as ratios. We've seen that many times. Like, if 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 you're fifty percent faster, then um, it would take you less time. But what percent less time? You'd have to convert to ratios. You'd say fifty percent faster means I'm three halves as fast. So it would take me two thirds as long, and two thirds as long means one third faster. So 33% faster is the correct answer. You can't really do that with just percents. You have to convert to ratios and then convert back to percents. Hey, I'm just gonna interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. Does anything jump out at you when, uh, when this question pops up on the screen? I definitely don't want to solve this algebraically because it's a two minute per question kind of test. Now, when you read the question itself, you realize it's a rate work question. And what's interesting is that we find out what units each variable has. The X and the Y are both in miles per hour. And the T is a different kind of, uh, of unit. It's, it's just hours. And what's the question asking for? How many miles? So we have, so those are the units we have. You've got your miles per hour, your miles, and your hours. Now, some of these answer choices have an additive relationship between different types of units which is nonsensical. I mean, for example, what's five miles per hour plus two hours? What is that? How do you even think about that? It's, it's nonsensical. I can't add five miles per hour with two hours. Uh, so which answer choices are doing that. Which answer choices can we just look at and say, hey, this is this is an impossible, like this doesn't even make sense. Which ones? Uh, yeah, I have a plus sign here in D between uh, miles per hour and uh, hours. And I have it here as well in E. Is there any other answer choice that has that? Yeah. So three answer choices are already gone without pen and paper. Now for the remaining two answer choices, which one do you think is simpler? Would you agree that answer choice A seems like a simpler answer choice? So what I would do now is look at the units in answer choice A and ask myself, would that give me miles because the question is asking about a number of miles and if answer choice a doesn't give us miles when we're when we do our analysis of the of the units then the answer must be c because it's the only one left so so let's check uh, we know that x and y have the exact same type of unit correct they're both in miles per hour so the miles per hour would just get reduced. Now, don't get confused here. I'm not saying that X and Y get reduced because I, I don't know what values X and Y are. I'm just saying the units of X and Y get reduced. So the miles per hour just disappears from this answer choice, leaving us with just the units of T, which was hours. But we are trying to solve for miles. So that eliminates answer choice A, and we're done. So if I'm at the test center, at this point, I pick C, I'm very confident, and I move on. Now, because we're not at the test center, let's also do a units analysis for answer choice C just for practice. But at the test center, I wouldn't be doing this. So the plus sign in the denominator means we're just, what are we doing there in the denominator? We're just adding miles per hour with some more miles per hour. So the units would just be miles per hour. That's the denominator. And I could reduce those units of miles per hour with either the units of x or the units of y in the numerator. It doesn't really matter which, which one. So I'm just going to go ahead and 
reduce the x plus y with the x on the top. So miles per hour got cancelled out with miles per hour. What do we have left? We have miles per hour in the y and we have hours in the t. What do you get if you multiply miles per hour times hour? You get miles. So c does in fact give us miles and it's the only one that uh, that's left so of course that's the right answer. Now you might be wondering well hang on what if more than one answer choice gave us units uh, that are in miles then what? And my answer to that question is then it wouldn't be a GMAT question because this question is in my mind it's very clearly designed to benefit people who think about units. And if they offer more than one answer choice that spits out miles, well then there goes the benefit that they, that they wanted to give to people who think about units. Uh, and then it would no longer be testing the thing that they wanted it to test. So I think it's absolutely by design that only one of the answer choices spits out miles when you look at the units. So I love how we've seen so far three different rate work questions today and each of them required a, a very different kind of, of thinking, a very different kind of solution. And you could solve every single one of them algebraically, you know, the proper mathematical way, and then they would all seem very similar to one another because we're solving all of them with algebra. But I think that misses the point. And I think that's not the way to improve on GMAT. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one good way to solve this question. Is It's a bit more algebraic and um, a little bit mindless, right? You just plug it into the formula and you're done. Uh, and uh, per perfectly fine. I have no issues whatsoever with that solution. And I think there's nothing wrong with that at the test center. Like if you have a good approach that you know you can do quickly and accurately and you're not worried about making careless mistakes and you know you know that you can do it, absolutely do it. At home, if you do it, you didn't learn much from it because you already knew how to do it. Uh, so for the test center, I love what you did, Sorjit. I think that's great. And just to repeat that for, for the rest of you, if you missed it, uh, in my book, I uh, give a shortcut formula for work rate questions, which says that the time that a job would take together is equal to the product over the sum of the individual times. Now they're asking for the individual time of machine B, so I'm just going to call that time B, it's what they're asking for, um, and I know the individual time for machine A, it's Y, so Y multiplied by the thing that we're trying to solve for over Y plus the thing that we're trying to solve for, according to that formula, is equal to the time it takes them together, which we know in this case is X. Uh, so now if we isolate B, we're done. And that's how Sorajit solved this. He said, uh, multiply both sides by Y plus B. You get Y times B equals XY plus XB. And we want to isolate B, so I'll subtract XB from both sides. So I get YB minus XB equals XY. And then if I factor out the B, I'll do that over here. So I have B, Y minus X equals xy. And then your last step would be to uh, divide both sides by y minus x and you get the answer. So that's uh, that's the um, what I would call the mindless way to solve this question. Usually on the GMAT when we have two machines and they're talking about the machines working together, I feel like usually we would be given the individual times, like how long it would take machine A and how long it would take machine B. So it strikes me as interesting that in this case, they gave us the time it takes them together, and then they gave us the time it takes one of them on its own. That's different from, from what you would typically see. And they're asking for the time that it would take the other one on its own. Now, I, I know the answer won't just be x minus y, because 
times are not additive. Rates are additive, but times are not additive. So it wouldn't make any sense to say y minus x. In fact, which do you think would be bigger, x or y? Apply some reasoning there. Can you tell which is bigger, x or y? y has to be bigger because on its own, machine A has to take more time to do a job than it would take two machines combined. When you get an extra machine helping you, it's going to take you less time. So x has to be smaller than y. Would you expect the correct answer choice to have the sum x plus y? Or would you expect it to have the difference between x and y, just given what x and y represent and given what they're asking for? It would have to be the difference, not the sum. That's right, because why are you adding the time that one of them takes on its own with the time that it takes them together to find the time that it takes the other machine on its own? That doesn't make sense. It would have to be the difference between the times. And that's either D or E, but we all agreed that X is smaller than Y, which would make D negative. And negative doesn't make sense, so the answer is E. That's a combination of intuition and reasoning to, uh, to get to the right answer without using pen and paper. JD did a great job doing a, a units analysis on these answer choices. He said, look, this is in hours, and this is in hours. And if we reduce the units, we just get no units. But I know that the correct answer should be in hours. And so A and B can be eliminated for that reason, and we're left with just C, D, and E. In C, we have hours multiplied by hours, so that's hours squared. And then we have hours in the denominator, so hours squared divided by hours is hours. So that's what we would expect to see, and the same goes for D and E. So C, D, and E are all okay in terms of their units. But at least we could eliminate two answer choices. Then what you can do is ratios. You can say, look, I know that machine A compared to together, who's faster? Well, of course, together they're faster, but how much faster? If we know the ratio of the times is uh, y to x, then the ratio of the rates is x to y. Now that I have rates, I can bring in also b and say that that would be y minus x. Because the speed at which b works is the difference between their combined speed and the speed at which x works, or a works. All right, so this is starting to look a lot like that previous question we did with the uh, faster pump and slower pump. Now, the question is asking about how long it takes B on its own. And we know how long it takes A on its own. We also know how long it takes them together. So at this point, you can choose one or the other. It doesn't matter. With the two pumps, it made sense to drop the middle column that had uh, the slower pump because that wasn't what they were asking about and also we didn't know anything about it. In this case we know about both of them so it doesn't matter which you drop. Let's just drop this one and focus on the last two columns. So now that I have the rates for those last two columns I can go back to times by flip-flopping there. So this would be the y minus x and this would be the y. And now we can say that together they would take y minus x over y as long as b takes on its own, or if you read it in the opposite direction, b would take y over y minus x, y over y minus x. b would take that fraction, y over y minus x, as long as they take together. How long do they take together? x hours. So that's the answer. I think what you're trying to say is that rates are additive and times are not additive. So if I know their individual rates, I can add them to get the combined rate, but I can't do that with time. Time is more complicated. Uh, yes, 
that's right. And so that's why we kind of have to keep going to the ratio of the rates to make our inferences because we can't really make additive inferences in a ratio of times. So we have to first flip flop the ratio, make turn it into a ratio of rates, make our additive inference, and then flip flop again for the appropriate columns, the one that we're interested in, uh, to get back to a ratio of times. That's what we saw both in the uh, swimming pool question and in this most recent question. I think it would be a lot easier for you with actual numbers and maybe practicing it with actual numbers a bit and then coming back here will be uh, a lot clearer, but let's look at an example with actual numbers so you can see uh, how much easier it is there. So if I just make up a, a story and I say, uh, you know, the ratio dogs to cats to uh, birds is seven to five to three. Okay, so then we can uh, draw out the ratio. So dogs, cats, birds, seven to five to three. Now, what can we say? We can say the following. I'm gonna uh, type two sentences and then I'll ask you guys to, uh, to give me some more. I can say that there are seven fifths as many dogs as there are cats. Does everyone agree with that sentence? Yeah. Yeah. There are three sevenths as many birds as there are dogs. Who wants to give me another one? There are five thirds as many cats as birds. Perfect. So now let's make it a bit harder. Now let's say that instead of seven to five to three, let's say that it's x minus y to z to a plus b. Now who wants to volunteer a sentence? That's perfect. I changed the wording a bit, but, but that's right. There are x minus y over z as many dogs as there are cats. So uh, what we could say there, and I'll type it just like I did on the whiteboard, we could say that um, to uh, B on its own would take Y over Y minus X as many hours as they take together to do a given job. That would be the kind of analogous inference from, so I got that from that bottom ratio here. And then I said, but wait, I know how long they take together to do a given job. They take X hours together to do a given job. So B would take Y over Y minus X times X hours. That's, that's how long B would take, and that's E. Yeah, that's the added complexity in this question compared to the birds, cats, and dogs. With birds, cats, and dogs, it's, it, it wasn't a multiplicative story. It was a much simpler story where you just have birds, cats, and dogs. In a work rate situation, that's a multiplicative story because something multiplied by something equals something, namely rate times time equals work. Uh, so that's a more complicated situation and there you would have to, because the rates are additive and the times are not, you have to go back and forth between a ratio of rates to ratio and time, of times and vice versa. And you would flip the, the ratio each time you, you make that switch because there, there's a reciprocal relationship between rate and time. The faster you are, the less time it takes you to do something. To recap, rate work questions are hard. <laughs> that's, that's the recap, I think. Uh, there's usually a way to solve these tough word problems without pen and paper. I guess that's another takeaway. Algebra and, you know, mindless procedures like that are sometimes good for test day, but we don't want to just use them at home and, and just be happy with that and move on to the next question because then we kind of wasted that question. We didn't really learn anything from it. And my hope is that the approaches we went through today will take our reasoning one step further. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. 
You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.